Well, hi everyone again. My name is Matias Flores. I'm a second year student the PhD in development sociology. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, hosting this uh, this new version of the seminar in critical development de development studies um, with a, 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 a huge invited uh, scholar from Chile. So I'm also really happy to introduce to have the opportunity to introduce him. Um, well, this uh, seminar is called the Rentierization of Food Regimes of Property and the Making of Chile's uh, Globalized Agriculture. Uh, the, our, our speaker is uh, Martin Arboleda. He's an assistant professor of sociology at Universidad Diego Portales, Santiago, Chile. His research explores the role of the commodity production uh, that commodity production performs in the political economy of global capitalism. His field of interest includes global political economy, critical social theory, and agrarian studies. He's currently working on a long-term research project on the political economy of the globalized food system, as well as on the social and political history of economic planning in Latin America. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to to, to, to listen to you, and I hope that we enjoy the, the presentation. Thank you, Martin. Well, thank you very much, Matias, for the for the introduction. Thank you also to David and Jenny for for the invitation. I'm I'm really and, and, and to Marvi for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. It's you know like a, a very exciting to talk to you about um, work in progress for uh, this project that uh, me and a colleague uh, are, are currently working on. So I'll, I'll share some, light, some, some slides with you. And basically, um, this isn't, can, can you see my slides? Is it uh, visible? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, so this is, uh, the subject of, of the presentation for today uh, is an article that is co-authored, uh, written in co-authorship by, by me and Thomas Purcell. Uh, and it's part of a broader project uh, that looks at uh, the question of property systems, global agrarian change, and also uh, the, the climate emergency. So, so we're really happy to be able to share this uh, research um we will we've already written a, a, a couple articles before this one so it builds it already builds upon uh, a, a strand of research right so uh well fortunately thomas was able to come today and and he will he will also be um uh, here so so um well to frame to frame this uh project into, into perspective. Uh, there are two major strands of literature uh, that have gained a lot of traction within uh, critical political economy and, and, and critical social theory, right? So on the one hand, there is an emerging strand of, 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 of works that focus on the rentier character of capitalism, right? The fact that uh, it is rentiers and not capitalists who are now who have now become sort of like the drivers of uh, dynamics of, of wealth creation, of class struggle in the in the neoliberal capitalist economy of the 21st century. And, and you might have seen this book by Brett Christopher's Rentier Capitalism, which is one of the most uh, salient interventions in this debate, right? But aside from Brett Christopher, there are several other authors and, and several special issues of journals uh, devoted to addressing the question of rent in the 21st century global economy. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there's also an emerging strand of scholarly work on the so-called logistics revolution, uh, which also maps and, and, and tries to make sense of this advanced phase of global functional integration in the capitalist economy, right? Through the rise of these uh, major logistical companies such as Amazon, Walmart, and various others, right? And, and as you can see here, uh, uh, this 2014 book by Deborah Cowan is also one of the 
key install um, publications in this tradition, right? So, and what's interesting is that these two uh, uh, strands of theory, to some extent, uh, would be uh, like a contradictory or point towards two very different phenomena, right? So on the one hand, you have rentier capitalism, which shows that there has been encroaching uh, socio-spatial fragmentation through these kinds of enclave economies, right? And on the other hand, you have this framework that posits a, a sprawling uh, expansion of logistics and, and, and infrastructure for technological connectivity and logistical connectivity, right? So these two strands would be po pointing towards what would seem a, 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 an apparent paradox, right? About, about the nature of the world, of the capitalist world system in the global economy. And, and part of what we intend to do in this article uh, is to build upon that conundrum and, and try to look at how these two phenomena uh, not only coexist, but actually, actually co-produce uh, each other, right? How how they become co-dependent on the other. Um, and one of the interesting things about about these two strands of literature is that they not only point towards new dynamics in in the process of capital accumulation in the twenty first century, but they that, but they they also point towards or hint at uh, the civilizational dynamics that would underpin this uh, new configuration of, of capitalism. So on the one hand, you have some authors claiming that the, that the emergence or re-emergence of, of the rentier economy signals uh, the uh, encroaching uh, forms of neo-feudalist social relations, right? So you have Cedric Durant's, this book, which was originally published in, in French, then in, in Spanish, I think it's forthcoming, forthcoming in English. Uh, this year or the next. But the argument is that uh, there is an, a, a, a certain paradox in the fact that sectors, strategic sectors in the global economy, such as the, the, the digital economy, have been contingent on the emergence or the resurgence of quasi-feudal or neo-feudal forms of social relations uh, based on really and on, on extremely hierarchical systems of of, of governance, corporate governance, decision making, and and several other character, and, and of course uh, um, rent extraction, right? And there is, on the other hand, uh, uh, a, a civilizational explanation of of what would seem to be the historical precedent of uh, the logistics revolution in what Jairus Banaji terms commercial capitalism, where uh, it is argued that that the that the uh, civilizational background or 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 foundation or driving force of capitalism of the commodity economy is commercial capitalism, the forms of commercial uh, exchange and intercourse that emerged uh, in in, in pre-modern societies. So, how to make sense of this conundrum and this apparent? Contradiction, right? And and this is what we have intended to, to set out to do in a previous article that we published in in, in the journal Antipode, and then through uh, this article on on the food system, right? So basically, what we intend to argue is that one of the one of the key, and in and, and now going to the field of agrarian studies, one of the key debates in the field of agrarian studies it has to do with the financialization or of, 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 the, of, the, of the food system as the driving force of, of neoliberal agriculture, right? So there's also been lots of, of articles, uh, special issues in journals, uh, writing about the financialization of agriculture, about the financial, financialization of food. And, and this, to some extent, has become the bit of, a, of, of the common sense that uh, frames the ways in which uh, neoliberal agriculture works, either through, let's say, for example, the global land rush, where you know, like vast tracts of land in the global south became the re recipients of speculative investment by hedge funds, institutional investors, 
and and you know like several other dynamics of financialization in in, in food in in food producers and 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 other dynamics of that sort right but what we intend to argue is that the perspective of the financialization of the foods of the of the food system grants ontological and methodological priority to markets over competitive land tenure and ownership right so uh to some extent, that view uh, forecloses the fact that sometimes it is uh, institutional systems of property which drive the dynamics of, of neoliberal agriculture, right? And so in the article, we try to build upon uh, the thesis of the agrarian origins of capitalism, which precisely points towards uh, the fact that it is the competitive dynamics of land tenure and ownership that uh, drive uh, the dynamics of capital accumulation and not commodification or market expansion as such, right? So, um, as and, and, and I mean, this thesis has been uh, developed systematically by authors of the likes of Ellen, Ellen Mason, Mason Wood, uh, Robert Brenner's own discussion of, of the transition uh, from, uh, from feudalism to capitalism. And also a new strand of, of critical theories of property, such as Brenna Vandar's book, uh, The Colonial Lives of Property. Um, what we find interesting about uh, the thesis of the agrarian origins of capitalism uh, is that it somehow uh, points us beyond uh, markets and, and commodification. And of course, and, and, and accordingly, uh, financialization as well, and looks and, and forces us to look at the institutional dynamics that drive capitalism and also the extra market, uh, non-commodified forms of social relations that also make capitalism possible, right? <clears throat> so seen in this way, the financial system, uh, and according, and this is, for example, according to Brett Christophers, the financial system uh, would be a leading rentier sector, and financialization the leading edge of rentierization. Right? If you start from the fact that the financial system uh, is a mechanism for the circulation of variegated kinds of assets of property, as you know, like fina uh, yielding financial rents, uh, that would lead you to a different uh, kind of perspective of, uh, of, of financialization, right? And of course, financialization would be uh, the kind of form of appearance of a prior process, which is uh, the transformation and circulation of institutional uh, regimes, regimes of property, right? And, and, and various property systems. And, and we think that uh, this has an important implication for understanding a global agrarian change as, as we will explore further ahead, right? So, but before we go into the implications for, for this approach on uh, the dynamics of, glo of global agrarian change, it is also important to note that uh, the idea of rentierization or, or the, the rise of the, of the rentier economy also has important implications over how we understand development in the first place, right? <clears throat> and at the heart of this question is, uh, what is the ontology of social change that underpins our own understandings of development? And what, what, what I want to argue is that uh, the spatial turn in social theory has led to a very particular kind of understanding on even development that uh, looks at Cumulative causation, right? Uh, and and this is you know like very much evinced. Let's say for example in the framework of uneven geographical development of authors such as David Harvey and Neil Smith, right? Uh, where they posit the dynamics of, of of capitalist expanded reproduction within a logic of uh, fixity and motion, right? Where there is an expanding commodity economy and in in a fragmenting capitalist system, right? But 
Uh, however, you know, like these approaches on development uh, are based on what Nancy Fraser calls uh, a, a, teleo a, a, a teleology or a, a fantasy of, of total commodification, right? It posits that, you know, like capitalist modernity uh, unfolds alongside a kind of a continuum uh, of from less to more commodification, right? Whereas in actual fact, uh, the commodity economy hinges upon and depends upon a vast realm of non-commodified, semi-proletarian, extra-market relations, right? That uh, to some extent are not like integrated, but become codependent on the commodity economy, right? And on this basis, uh, it is also relevant to note that, you know, like the, the looking at the implications of the, of the rentier economy in, in contemporary capitalism, demands going beyond that kind of linear teleology of uneven uh, geographical development and engaging with the question of combined and uneven development, right? So for example, I mean, and, and when I say combined and uneven development, I want to, I'm, I'm making a nod to Ernest Mandel's uh, definition of, of capitalism as a complex amalgam of past and present modes of production, right? That have been woven together by uh, the capitalist world market, right? So, so it is important to keep in mind that these pre-capitalist, pre-modern forms of social mediation uh, have not been obliterated or displaced, right? But have rather come into interaction with the commodity economy in ways that are more complex and intricate, right? And it is interesting that, that we've been mapping some of the literature uh, on, on, on the rentier economy in Latin America. And this understanding of combining uneven the development uh, plays an important role in, in the ways in which, in which the rentier economy is understood, right? So for example, the Enrique Lucel's book Towards an Unknown Marx, uh, a, a book written in the 1980s, uh, in originally in Spanish, this was a, a more recent uh, English translation. Uh, Enrique Dustel argues that the capitalist economy uh, becomes like this kind of, of, of uh, force that swallows pre-capitalist forms of social mediation, uh, but to only, you know, like spew them out afterwards in a more advanced configuration, right? And, and, and becomes this kind of, you know, like a, a center that uh, around which uh, various other forms of social relations gravity. And he's speaking about, you know, like not only rentier, but, you know, like speculative uh, financialized economies, commercial capitalism, right? Commercial capitalism is an antediluvian form, a transhistorical form of, of, of social and economic, and economic relations. But Enrique Dussel argues that uh, under capitalist modernity, these uh, transhistorical forms assumed an, a more advanced configuration, right? So, so it is also very in, uh, interesting to, to note, you know, like uh, sort of the, the civilizational dynamics of this problem, which of course, you know, like are also present in David Harvey's own reading of, of the rentier economy, right? Where, where he argues that, you know, like Marx was not fully convinced by uh, the Ricardian understanding of rentiers as being just, you know, like a lazy, uh, you know, like remnant, like a remnant of, of the feudal economy. For Marx, there was a functional, I mean, rentiers and the land holding classes performed a functional role within capitalist expanded reproduction, right? And, and for Marx or the Marxian theory of rent is an effort to think about how uh, land holding classes and the rentier economy uh, in general becomes instrumentalized and, and, and made functional to uh, the commodity economy, right? So also an important work in this, in this vein is also Bolivar Echeverria's a classic book on, on volume two of Capital, where he argues that uh, Marx's schemes for the circulation of capital in volume two, um, were to some extent oblivious that there was a kind of a quasi sector of extra market social relations that uh, were fundamental 
for the circulation of the commodity economy. And he was speaking here about, for example, you know, like uh, people who perform, you know, like uh, unpaid care work uh, on the one hand, and also uh, land holding classes, own, the owners of, of landed property, uh, who had a, a, a different ways of, of, of engaging with uh, the production of, of wealth, right? So I, I wrote a, a recent commentary on the journal Dialogues in Human Geography, where I tried to map uh, a bit uh, kind of these discussions and, and the implications they would have for uh, understanding or, or kind of, of going back or rethinking the theories of, of uneven and combined development, right? So, <clears throat> but to go back to the article, I mean, it is important that these theories of, of combined and uneven development precisely point into focus the fact that the rentier economy and the logistics technological revolution are not anathema to each other, right? And, and this is kind of like the basic insight that emerges from our reading. They are not anathema to each other, but they are, or they become engaged in a dynamic of functional imbrication, right? So why is this important? Uh, because uh, that, that insight would lead us to think rent in a different, more, more expansive light, right? And, and on that basis, our article proposes uh, this definition of rent. So rent would be a class relation that relies on the monopoly control of the circuit of capital or any of its components. So, so let, let me uh, excavate and, and, and kind of dissect what are the implications and, and, the, and some of the key elements of this definition of rent, right? So <clears throat> first, uh, insofar as it would uh, that rent implies the monopoly control of the circuit of capital, not only landed assets, it would not be limited to the ownership of the land, right? So basically, and, and as you all know, uh, rent theory become a major theoretical debate in classical political economy in the 19th century uh, with the, the British economists, especially Ricardo, with the, physio, the French physiocrats. Uh, and, and for Marx as well, uh, rent was to some extent uh, theoretically, analytically, and methodologically connected to the ownership of the land, right? But we want to position our, our article within new uh, readings of rent theory that have tried to rethink rentier dynamics beyond landed property, right? And, and, and see how rent, we, we can also see the presence of, of rent relations within uh, the digital economy, uh, 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 intellectual property monopolies, uh, financial uh, instruments, and so on, as we will detail later on. A second implication, and this uh, has to do with the, the, the approach of combining uneven development that I was uh, talking about a, a while ago. It is not limited to a relation of distribution. And, and this means it would not be anathema to competitive market conditions, right? So and this is also hugely relevant because there is an important strand of, of neo-Keynesian neo economic theory, let's say, you know, like uh, close to, for example, Mariana Mazzucato, where, where, where it is usually or commonly argued that the economy is sharply distinguished between those that produce value and those that extract value, right? And those that extract value would be uh, rentiers, right? And that the rentier economy is a bit of a burden on real uh, economic growth and real uh, technological innovation and market dynamism and, and so on, right? So we want to kind of uh, uh, challenge this idea by saying that rent is not limited to a relation of distribution. And here we build upon David Harvey's own uh, rereading of the Marxian theory of rent, where he says that uh, um, rent becomes a fundamental element in the allocation uh, of, of investment to the built environment. And in that sense, it becomes a driving force of capitalist expanded reproduction, right? So that would be a second 
uh, implication of, of the way in which we understand rent. And third, it would involve the generation of profit, of profit through legal and institutional rather than purely economic channels, right? So this is you know, like also an important implication because we need to distinguish rent from the generation of profit through uh, commodity and market exchange, right? So, so uh, it's important to, to highlight the fact that rent extraction uh, operates through financial and legal mechanisms rather than through commodity production and exchange. Okay, so on that basis, uh, our article sets out to describe and, and lay out three kinds of rents that are operating in the, in the Chilean uh, food system, right? So, so we basically take a look at some of the most recent and important transformations in, 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 in the Chilean uh, export-oriented agricultural economy and look at how um, regimes of property, rent, uh, and, 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 rent and, and dynamics of rentiership have enabled uh, the um, development of these kinds of, of new agricultural dynamics, right? So, and basically we, we argue that to more accurately understand the, kind, the kinds of rents operating in the, in the export-oriented agricultural economy, we distinguish between three types of rents in accordance to three to the three circuits of capital laid out uh, in, in, in volume two of capital, right? In, in the critique of political economy. So it would be production rents, circulation rents, and financial rents, right? Because as you know, the three circuits outlined in, the, in, in, in volume two are uh, the, the circuit of productive capital, the circuit of commodity capital, and the circuit of money capital. So basically production rents, let's, let's go like uh, through each of these uh, types of, of rents, right? So production rents would be all those forms of rents that uh, would operate in the production of agricultural commodities through the use of land and the combination of land with uh, uh, instruments uh, of production, right? So it would encompass, of course, the use and governance of land, but also of water, seeds, mechanical inputs, fertilizers, and various other and, and other uh, technical and, and agrochemical inputs required for the production of, of food commodities, right? Uh, for commodity exports. And it is, it is particularly interesting to see how, uh, of course, you know, like land markets uh, in not only in Chile, but in Latin America have been very dynamic since the onset of the neoliberal uh, turn in, in, in Latin America, right? So, uh, and especially in Chile after the agrarian reform, uh, during the military dictatorship, there were many institutional reforms oriented towards uh, uh, attracting investment for the acquisition of lands, right? And so land became a very uh, attractive asset for financial investment, right? And, and there has been a tendency towards the, the, the concentration of the lands, according to a, a recent report. Well, it's not actually not so very recent. It's from 2017. Uh, it argues that Chile has the second uh, highest uh, land Gini coefficient in Latin America after Paraguay. So it is the second uh, Latin American economy uh, with the highest degree of, of land con concentration or concentration in land tenure. And we have to take these uh, figures with a grain of salt because the last agricultural uh, census uh, that took place in Chile was in 2007. This year, supposedly there, there will be a new agricultural census with new, with, with uh, updated figures. But uh, other data sources point towards the fact that there has been an important tendency towards the concentration of land markets. And this means that the land holding classes have come to assert increasing economic and political power in uh, the Chilean economy, right? Something similar has happened with water. 
right? Because the water code, the uh, water rights in Chile uh, were also liberalized uh, during the military dictatorship. And uh, they, they were made freely tradable through spot and also financial markets, right? And this important institutional uh, process led to a, a, pro, a process of, of hoarding of water rights, right? So many of the water rights are used for industrial and agricultural uh, activities, right? But many other water rights uh, have been widely used for hoarding and speculation purposes, right? So, so here is, you know, like an important aspect where we can see this sharp distinction where, you know, like a, a, a water is used as a commodity or as an input in production or used as a scarce asset uh, for uh, which, from which to draw financial or yield financial rents in, in, in financial markets, right? So okay, so so in in this kind in this first type of, of rents, you know, like we can see that you know, like land and water uh, constitute some of the key aspects of this of this uh, uh, form of, of rent extraction, but also uh, seeds uh, are, a, are a very important component of this, especially as intellectual property uh, regimes have become increasingly uh, uh, generalized across. Uh, Chilean agriculture, right? And, and there's been, you know, like important political disputes over uh, these kinds of uh, intellectual property frameworks. And right now there, there is a, a major political deadlock for the signing the, this international treaty, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which is believed will intensify the, the frameworks for intellectual property, uh, in, especially in seeds. Right. <clears throat> Second, uh, and this is also, and, and, and here is where, you know, like uh, our, our definition of rent starts to supersede the question of landed property. And we start to look at dynamics of rent extraction that take place beyond agricultural production uh, and the land proper, right? So circulation rents would be all of the rents that would uh, circulate and become extracted after the production of the agricultural commodity and, and which would enable uh, the, sh the travel of the commodity from production to the market, right? So this would include all the logistical facilities, storage facilities, and the various or, uh, other forms of exchange dynamics that enable uh, commodities to travel to the markets, right? So first and foremost, storage facilities uh, have become a key source of or, or a key cost for uh, globalized commodities, especially as uh, commodities become increasingly integrated in, in global consumer markets in the global north, right? Let's say, you know, like with the supermarket, supermarket revolution, uh, storage facilities become increasingly, became increasingly predominant in the functioning of global commodity chains or buyer-driven commodity chains, right? So there's been also a host of, 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 of theoretical work trying to look at those storage facilities as sites where um, some forms of, of rents are, are captured, right? Mm. Also, it's also important to know, but well, you, you would also argue that, that, okay, so, but storage facilities operate in, you know, like in landed assets. So they could eventually be a form of, of you know, uh, rents drawn from landed property. Uh, and yeah, we, we must, we must, we could argue that, that they are right, but, but if we look at other the aspects of the, of, of, of the process of circulation, we could see, for example, the relationship of export commodities and uh, farmers involved in the, on, in, in the contract farming scheme, right? So the, the phenomenon here is very interesting because uh, the relationship between exporting commodities and contract farming is a very particular contractual relationship where exporting, co exporting companies command the technical facilities, the know-how, the contacts, you know, like the legal regulations to access international uh, markets, right? And they charge farmers a premium for, uh, for being able to access these markets, right? 
So in that sense, they, they charge uh, a kind of a, 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 a right, a, a, a told, you know, like for, for farmers to be able to, to, to put their commodities into, into the market. And the relationship that exists here is very similar to the one that has been theorized, for example, in the case of, of Airbnb and the kind of network effects that digital platform technologies exert over, for example, uh, tenants, right? And, and, you know, like landlords in, in real estate markets, right? So if you want to lease your apartment for a short period of time, you need to go through uh, Airbnb and, you know, like pay a premium to Airbnb to be able to lease your apartment, right? So in the same way, uh, farmers involved in the, in, the, in the contract farming scheme depend on the technical know-how, the, the contacts, and, and basically the network effects of exporting companies, which are highly concentrated and charge a high uh, commission for uh, their service, right? <clears throat> Ports and concessions, and you know, like one of the major uh, institutional transformations of the privatization of, the, of, of, of agriculture in Chile has been uh, uh, using concessions to give uh, uh, you know, like vast tracts of infrastructure and land, and also logistical infrastructure such as ports to private operators, right? And and this has also been you know like a studied topic uh, of how the land has been harnessed for increasing the performance and and the velocity uh, at which commodities circulate in uh, across logistical infrastructure. So. Mm -hmm. And also the certification schemes, you know, like the global gap uh, mechanisms for, uh, you know, like good agricultural practices, the kind of, you know, like gap procedures uh, for good agricultural practices have also been uh, theorized as an instance of rents that are drawn from the exchange process or the circulation process, right? Because uh, the global gap certification schemes uh, have some degrees or, or requirements, minimum requirements of, you know, like debt capacity, debt capacity, market capacity, you know, like technical inputs that immediately uh, exclude various uh, configurations of, you know, like medium, small sized and even medium sized agricultural producers, right? And, and it's also expensive and costly to, do, to go over to these kinds of certification schemes. So, the global gap system has also been considered, and we looked at the ways in which in, in the Chilean economy, these kinds of certification schemes become transformed into a, into a scarce, into a scarce asset, right? That, that, that uh, is, is uh, operates as a form of, of a, uh, rent, right? And finally, uh, third, uh, it is financial rents, right? So the financial system, uh, first and foremost, it is also important to highlight the fact that neoliberalism in Chile has led to the emergence of a wide array of financial asset owners, right? The owners of money capital. So this was embedded within the initial design that the Chicago boys uh, uh, had in mind with the, when they drafted this roadmap for neoliberal restructuring of the economy and ladrillo or the brick, right? They wanted to create this kind of hugely dynamic, immensely dynamic capital market, uh, basically in the in the aspiration to create uh, financial asset owners who would give dynamism and would allocate investment into agriculture uh, among other strategic sectors, right? So for them, you know, like. Uh, dynamic capital markets were a precondition for the modernization of agriculture. And here is another, yet another one of the, of the instances where we see how these kinds of debt instruments uh, or, you know, like money assets uh, are tied to uh, the, the, the process of, of actual capitalist uh, commodity production, right? So, uh, so financial rents have been drawn from various forms of mechanisms. So first and foremost, you know, like there were Chile implemented during the, the, the neoliberal transition uh, uh, 
a variety of debt instruments called debt, equi debt equity swaps, right? So uh, these were directed for uh, investors to acquire land and other productive assets uh, so that they could be exchanged for uh, uh, Chile's uh, sovereign debt, right? Um, also, pension funds have served as an important mechanism uh, for the reallocation of, of, of uh, investments through, you know, like the pooling of pension, of money from pensions, right, from, from workers and households. And also debt instruments under the contract farming scheme, right? So it's also interesting that, that exporting companies using the contract farming scheme not only enable farmers and outgrowers to put their commodities into the market, but they also offer debt, right? Credit uh, instruments, right? So, so they also allocate debt instruments and financial instruments to farmers so that they can uh, invest on, on uh, farming inputs or, or you know, like land or, or whatever. But uh, these also become sources or, or first, I mean, of financial liquidity for farmers but and 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 of you know like a, of, of financial rents for exporting companies so in this way we see how these three types of of rents uh, are are present in the in, in chile's agricultural economy and i think that one one challenge of of a methodological challenge i mean of the rentier economy is to how to methodologically delucidate or dissect the types of relations that would classify as, as rent as rentier and those that would classify as properly capitalist right and i think this is a an important uh challenge insofar as if if we overstretch too much the concept of rent uh it would be problematic because it would be conflate it, it would conflate various forms of relations into, into a single umbrella, right? And, and this is, for example, something that was recently pointed by Matt Hoover in an intervention, uh, in, in a recent intervention on, on, on the rentier economy, where he argued that, yes, it is important to look at the ascendancy and the increasing predominance of rent in the capitalist economy, but we shouldn't forget that capitalists are also the owners of the means of production. Right, so this, this poses a fundamental analytical and methodological uh, challenge and conundrum, right? And, and, and basically our intuition for this question is that we, we have to look at, you know, like uh, the functional, uh, how is, uh, you know, like a, a, a property become utilized, right? Is it being mobilized for the production of commodities or uh, for yielding uh, profits without engaging properly engaging in the production of commodities. So yes, I mean it is an open question. I think one of the one of the key challenges that that this new discussion on rent theory will have to face is you know, like how to how to distinguish analytically between these different kinds of relationships. And also, mm, uh, we also I, I also want to wrap up here with a, a short reflection on where this project is, is going in the future. So the prospects of, of this project, right? So, and we have been very interested in the political implications of the rentier economy, right? So what are the actual uh, ramifications of encroaching rentier relations in the institutional systems or institutions of, of or the institutions of representative democracy, right? And it's very interesting that you know there's a new literature on on extreme social inequality, especially after the, the 2008 crisis and after the COVID pandemic, that shows how uh, inequality has become uh, increasingly uh, extreme, especially as a result of the concentration of wealth, not too much income, but wealth uh, inequality, right? And this is, for example, something that's been pointed out by the World Inequality Lab that says that, you know, like uh, standard measurements of inequality on the basis of income are completely inaccurate and insufficient to understand the fact that wealth concentration is a new vector 
where we can understand the mutation of class power and extreme inequality in, in the in, in the 21st century uh, capitalist economy, right? So in a recent report by CEPAL, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, they argue uh, and, and they, they actually warn about the problematic tendency for the extreme concentration of wealth, not only in the world, but especially in the region, in the Latin American region. And they, they argue that Chile is the Latin American country uh, where billionaires, hold the largest percentage of wealth uh, in terms of, of percentage of GDP, right? So Chile, Chilean billionaires have approximately, hold approximately 16% uh, of, of the country's GDP. By all means, you know, like a staggering uh, amount of wealth. Uh, the second in this, uh, as you can see in this graph, is Brazil with 14% of GDP. Right, and, and also an important finding in this report is the fact that the evolution of billionaire wealth in Latin America according to activity or according to sector, uh, you can see that the, the sector of alimentos y bebidas or, or food and beverages uh, is the one that plays you know, like a, one, a major role after you know, like mining and metals, and there is you know, like a broader category of other other sectors, but there is you know, like mining and and food and beverages, right? So the food economy it hints at the fact that the food economy is an important uh, or a key sector in the concentration in the encroaching encroaching concentration of billionaire wealth, right? So we want to our you know like uh, our prospects for this project is to look at how these dynamics of wealth concentration through the rentier economy metastasize and transform into uh, the oligarchization of power, of political power, and, and the erosion of democratic institutions. <clears throat> okay, so basically, and this is just to, to finalize uh, the presentation, I'd like to hear your views on, on this. Uh, so uh, first, financialization or commodification in and of themselves, cannot fully account for conditions of extreme social inequality and oligarchic power in global agrarian change, right? We also need to look at the institutional systems of property and at the circulations, at the circulation of wealth in asset form, right? And, and who captures and who owns uh, these assets. Second, the rentarization of the food economy has shifted from an emphasis on distinct assets and by this I mean lands, right? Towards the governance of the global commodity chain as an integrated total system. So as we can see, uh, the, 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 the food economy in Chile shows a, a, an important degree of, of vertical integration where uh, some capitalists operating as in, uh, in, 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 in the financial system are also, you know, like involved in the operation of, of large agricultural estates and, you know, like in the port industry as well. So there's a, a high degree of vertical integration, which shows that, you know, like the commodity, the commodity chain itself has become a source of, you know, like power, uh, wealth creation and distribution in the economy, right? So this is sort of also an important takeaway of this article. And third, uh, this reading of rent offers a counterpoint to its usual neo-Ricardian and neo-Keynesian interpretations. In which respect? I mean, we, we intend to argue that the, the encroaching expansion of the, of the, of the, of the rentier economy has not become, uh, uh, has not hindered growth. I mean, growth in standard, uh, you know, like GDP terms, uh, but rather the opposite holds true, right? It has become a lever and precondition for expanding, you know, like enlarging rounds of in, uh, agro-industrial expansion and production, right? So this in turn, this reading of rent enables us to understand capitalism precisely as this complex amalgam of past and present modes of production, right? Where these pre-modern forms of social and economic relations as is, you know, like a rent uh, become woven together and, and become functionally imbricated in the commodity economy. So yes, I think I'll, I'll leave it uh, here for now. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Martin, for your presentation. And we, I also wanted to welcome Thomas uh, Purcell, the co-author of this article on work in progress. Um, so we'll have now the chance for a Q&A. Uh, so every, it, everyone that has a, a question could raise their hands or, or put the question in the chat. Uh, so, um, well, was, yeah, we don't have questions in the chat. So if anyone can want to share something, David, yes. Yeah, for, first off, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it was really illuminating. Um, and uh, you did a really, really excellent job of weaving together these theoretical questions with with the case of of Chile's food system. Um, I had a, maybe more of a clarifying question. Um, one part of your argument in sort of the first half um, when you were discussing uh, the definition of of rent that you and Thomas um, have come up with is you is you define it as um, as monopoly control of the circuit of capital and its components, but say that that is not necessarily anathema to um, um, market competition. And I didn't quite understand how you, how you got to that conclusion. Is that because it's competition over the monopoly itself, or is that be, like I didn't the, that to me seemed to be a paradox, and I didn't and I didn't fully understand. Um, how you got that conclusion. So I'd love to hear more about that. Martin or Thomas, you want to answer? Yeah, so, well, thank you very much, David, uh, for, for that question. I mean, yes, and, and, and thank you for pointing this out in the in the in our definition of, of rent, you know, like I think it points to, to what is, you know, like perhaps the crux of the argument. And, and it also points towards, you know, like what we see as, you know, like what we could bring into the into the conversation, right? Because you know, like what some of the most uh, predominant uh, frameworks within the discussion on rent have to do with this idea that you know like there are those who produce value and there are those to who basically just extract value, right? And the neo-Keynesian understanding of, of rent is basically uh, deems rent a kind of an unproductive form of economic relation that, that is basically a, incompatible with a, a dynamic, you know, like competitive market economy, right? So in that sense, I don't know, Thomas, if you want to. Um... Yeah, sure. I think, uh, thanks, David, for the question. Uh, thanks, Martin. No, I think the thing that this goes to the heart, I think, in many ways of the of the theoretical work we're trying to do with with the with the concepts of rent, and in part it links to kind of how do we think about the existence and capture of rent beyond traditional landed forms of property and the kind of you know Marxian ground rent. And I think most of the current rent literature does a lot of good work in in showing how there are ways in which rent is appropriated that are not contingent upon the old forms of monopoly in land, but rather monopoly control over assets, finance, seeds, you know, things that uh, Ward and Albers did quite well by kind of taking rent theory beyond the land. Now, where we come into this, and this is where the circuits thinking helps, is that we're not fully convinced by Brett Christopher's argument, where he proposes a hybrid theory of rent between kind of the neoclassical idea of the absence of competition and the more heterodox idea of, of scarcity over um, control over scarce assets. And for him, that points towards the absence of genuine forms of market competition or things where there's bad accumulation and good accumulation. I think what we're trying to do here is point towards rent as a more dialectical way of thinking about how competition and production go hand in hand with some forms of rent appropriation. And actually, rentiers, particularly within the food system, have been shown, at least in our research, to be quite crucial to expanded forms of accumulation. So it's kind of it's trying to run with this idea of rent not being this kind of Ricardian 
or, or neo-Keynesian limit to uh, competition, notwithstanding the fact that there can be, you know, these monopoly uh, entities which do seem to be barriers uh, to competition. Yeah, thank you. That's a really important and relevant point. And I would also like to add the kind of a more uh, civilizational or perhaps, you know, like a sociological implication of this insight. Because, for example, you have in this, you know, like new, more recent discussions of, of so called neo feudalism. You have, for example, you know, like the idea of techno feudalism that's been popularized by people like Yanis Varoufakis, for example. He says that, you know, like the kind of competitive, you know, like uh, market capitalism or the, or the conditions of competitive market capitalism that were theorized by Adam Smith, you know, like in the 19th century, do no longer exist, right? You know, like uh, we have shifted, you know, like capitalism has become degraded into uh, this kind of, you know, like highly hierarchical, non-competitive form of, of techno-feudalism. And he calls it techno-feudalism, right? So we are no longer living in a capitalist economy. Uh, whereas, you know, like uh, Cedric Durand uh, says, okay, look, uh, there are, you know, like some silos, some, some, you know, like sites of, you know, like neo-techno-feudalist relations, but this does not mean that capitalism as a whole has become transformed into a new feudal uh, societal regime, right? So, so basically he shows the fact that the the high tech sector you know like silicon valley you know like technology companies exhibit some forms of feudal uh, characteristics but that they are interdependent or you know like uh, co-produced with the market economy so he shows that these dynamics are compatible and actually need feel upon and need you know like a uh, competition right and 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 i think that's more sort of in line with what, what we intend to, to do with this article, to, to place, you know, like our own understanding of rent within this conceptualization of combined and uneven development, right? Where, where we can see how these pre-modern forms, uh, monopoly ownership, you know, like a, a concentration in, in land tenure are, you know, like a, in, in, in dialectical relationship with uh, market systems and, and, and the commodity economy. I don't know if that. Yeah, 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 that definitely answers my question. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, we're about to, to more questions. Please, please. Thank you for the presentation, Martin. That was really interesting. And um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could say more about um, this question you raised briefly um, around the difference between um, rentierism and the, and the ownership of um, the means of production and this kind of methodological challenge of um, figuring out um, when and where to apply which frameworks, how it's useful, um, when it becomes overgeneralizing and then kind of limiting. Um, so yeah, I guess if you guys could just talk more about like where the, where um, in your work you're kind of drawing those lines and how you're thinking about those critiques um, more specifically. Well, thank you, Liz. That's a, a really, really good question and important. I think a pressing methodological question for, for this kind of, of research on, on rent, right? Which, which uh, you know, like will become increasingly, you know, like in, in important in the in the next few years. You know, like there's increasing increasing approaches to look at, at rent from different angles. So, so I think it's important to lay out some methodological or you know, like a uh, try to develop a more precise formulations uh, of, of, how, of what do we understand by rent because you know like I think it's important to otherwise you know like it will become a chaotic concept right and, and will be used for to, to describe everything and not will not have too much analytical uh, worth you know so I don't know Thomas if you want to go ahead and, and try to 
I have some ideas, and, and, and you know, this is something that it's not fully fleshed out yet in, in, in the research. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a, I think it's very productive, you know, like for, for us to discuss. And I, we would also love to know your, your thoughts on this, right? I mean, uh, but I don't know, Thomas, if you, I have yeah, some ideas, no, maybe I, if you go. No, I think, I think it's, in, in many ways, it's a kind of, it's, a, it's an empirical puzzle, isn't it? It's a conundrum. I mean, I think one of the ways that helps me think about this is that, the 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 rent as a kind of social relationship often means that there there are social roles that are performed within how rent is captured and land is leased and and the relationships that inhere around landed property and often um, the the rentier and the capitalist can be the same the same figure right so if you have a landlord state the state can be the entity which perhaps owns the mining lands or oil lands but also produces on those lands and that means that landlord figure internalizes the social role of both the capitalist and the ronte and normally that would mean that the kind of the capitalist would make the average rate of profit in the sector and then the ronte would get the surplus because of their ownership of the lands now where it gets more interesting and more complex is when capitalists or capital seeks to access lands or monopoly owned property through competition right so if there's competition to access a scarce asset and that can be land and non-landed that tends to inflate the price of that asset through which the landlord can then capitalize that as the rent in the price of the rental agreement and that often means then that the landed figure is separate from capital but that is often open to empirical investigation and i think it it's kind of has sectoral specificities um and kind of complex dynamics but i think i often help i think it's helpful in our own research that we've done is that these are social roles that can internalize can be internalized in the same figure or and also they can be more the kind of the tripartite of land labor and capital in the kind of you know the classic trinity form that marx critiques smith for yeah that's that's very interesting you know like that the, the 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 idea that you know like a, a single economic actor can internalize different functions in different periods of time so for example wallerstein argued that uh, there's you know like a famous quote by wallerstein that says that every every bourgeois aspires to be an aristocrat right so and and you know like this this kind of this uh, phrase you know like uh, powerfully encapsulates what thomas was saying uh, a while ago right so and, and, and this is something that, for example, is also pointed out by, by Joseph Schumpeter, who says that, you know, like every, you know, like a, a process of scientific and technological innovation goes through phases of, you know, like production, you know, like an innovation, and then transforms into a monopoly, right? Because what's the point of doing the hard work of scientific and technological innovation if afterwards you will not be able to reap uh, the fruits of that labor through patents, let's say, you know, like copyrights, licenses and so forth. And from once, I mean, from first having been, you know, like a, a capitalist who produces, like, let's say, you know, like vaccines, you develop the formula for the vaccine, start to sell the actual commodities, uh, but then you just sell the license for others to produce. And you basically, you know, like live, uh, draw, extract rents from that license, right? So, so something similar happens in like software and various other, instances of, of scientific and technological innovation where commodity production to, at some point shifts towards a more rent oriented uh, business model right so so and that was you know, like and Schumpeter has also been you know like uh, 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 also uh, brought also to think about these uh, types of, of of processes so my guess would would be that you know like uh, it's always an empirical question i mean uh, we cannot a priori assume that there is some form of rent rentier or rent, rent extraction without empirically looking at, at what 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 point in the commodity chain what time in history what what period uh, in in a specific economic sector uh, actors are are engaging in in rentier dynamics um, and this is also something that's pointed out by Brett Christopher's, right? He also he also shows at the he also points towards the methodological complexities uh, of working with with the rent uh, category precisely 
because uh, sometimes people, let's say, you know, like uh, are a capitalist in terms of, you know, like they, they have um, a, a factory that produces commodities, right? Uh, but they, they are also, they also own uh, an institutional, like a, 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 an asset management firm, right? So sometimes the same business conglomerates have, you know, like a material operations of production and, you know, like asset management firms and other, you know, like a, um, financial intermediation firms that are more closely aligned with uh, rentier operations. So yes, I mean, it is an empirical conundrum, but I think that uh, it's still, it is still something that needs uh, to be more fully fleshed out given that, uh, again, you know, like this will become an increasingly predominant uh, strand of research. And, and so I think, you know, like uh, there, a, a, a methodological exploration and how to grapple with this, I think would be hugely, hugely relevant. We have a question in the chat. Let me. From Swarnar Gosh, thanks for this presentation. Could you say something about the relationship between your theorization of rent theorization and recent theorization of state capitalism? I'm thinking specifically about the activities of the Chinese dragon head enterprises in Central Asia. South, South Asia and Latin America, including their involvement in regional land and capital markets. Wow, really, really good question, sort of, and, and good to see you here. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, I mean, good and difficult question. I don't know, Thomas, if you have a, uh, some kind of, uh, I, I mean, my, my only, you know, like intuition here would be to think about, you know, like the the idea of of the land of, of the landlord state, you know, like Fernando Coronil, or but I don't know, Thomas, if you if you have some some ideas. Yeah, no, I think I think that. it's a very interesting. I think that's a very uh, it's a very interesting question. I'm the the recent work on state capitalism makes you think of um, our friend and colleague Ilias Salami's work. Mm. Adam Dixon, uh, they had a recent special issue on the emergence of state capitalism and. And that theorization and I, I specifically have not worked on that issue but in a, in a prior project to working on uh the paper with martin in chile i worked um in in ecuador <clears throat> and part of one of the projects we were looking at the relationship between the ecuadorian state and chinese development banks principally through large-scale um hydroelectric um electricity infrastructure and um, ecuador took out huge loans um to build a new energy infrastructure. And one of the flagships was a dam called the Coca-Cola Sinclair um, Dam on the Napo River, uh, financed by $2 billion loan um, with loans for oil contracts. And that offered an interesting way to think about the relationship between kind of resource spaces of accumulation as in Ecuador and relationships with Chinese companies and, and the Chinese state. And one of the things that we found or I found in that research were the, the interest rates on the loans were much higher than you would find on commercial interest rates with, say, uh, capital markets or even development loans by the World Bank. Um, and that was one mechanism through which the Chinese state and these Chinese companies were able to appropriate rent via the financing packages to Ecuador, who were repaying the debt via the export of oil so it was loans for oil contracts and by tracing that linkages of kind of resource exports and the financing of large-scale infrastructure in latin america it opened an, it opened an interesting window onto um i mean what some have been kind of inclined to think about as new forms of neo-colonialism or imperialism in latin america via chinese lending i'm less convinced by those categories analytically but I think you can do a lot of work thinking through Ron theorization with those type of new development initiatives, right? Because in 2015, China became the biggest lender, development lender to Latin America, um, surpassing the World Bank. And Ecuador was one of the spaces um, where lending was huge, particularly 
um, under the, the Korea government, less so nowadays. But that's one of the ways I've been thinking through some of these issues in beyond, beyond the Chilean context. Yeah, I also want to add that there's also a really interesting geopolitical implication of, of state capitalism and the rentier question, insofar as uh, there's been also still at a very inchoate stage. I mean, this is something that's not still, you know, like a deliberate political program by, by, by the left. Um, but there's this idea, you know, like this, you know, like a old idea of, you know, like structure, structuralist economics to, you know, like assert, you know, like a natural resource wealth as a kind of a strategic sector for programs of, you know, like redistribution and even, you know, like industrial policy, right, to shift towards a diversified economy. So this was, for example, you know, like most cl clearly exemplified and Thomas might be able to, to speak about this in more detail the Korea government and, and the kind of, you know, like resource nationalism that that the Korea government exhibited in, in during his tenure in Ecuador, right? So, and it's very interesting how, you know, like I've read some recent publications on, on rent that show that, you know, like we need to start thinking about rent in emancipatory terms as well, right? You know, you know like if, you know, like popular governments reach public office, you know, like through electoral mechanisms, they can and ought to, they need to, you know, like a, a harness and mobilize their natural resource wealth uh, through, you know, like basically, you know, like to extract rent, you know, like uh, to, to underpin, you know, like projects of structural transformation towards a different kind of, you know, like production, you know, like a different kind of economic model. So it's very interesting how the question of rent has become position and have tr has tried to uh, become, you know, like reinterpreted in a more emancipatory way uh, for the political left, right, as a potential tool, and especially potential tool for, you know, like against, you know, like a foreign, uh, you know, like a imperialism, imperialist dynamics, and so forth, right. I think that is yet to be seen, but you know, like in, in Matt Hoover's recent article or review on, on the question of rent, he also cites, he speaks about, he, he talks about this question of how let's say, for example, the, the OPEP, you know, the oil producing economies form a large geopolitical block, uh, basically, you know, like uh, against, you know, like uh, industrialized economies uh, using, you know, like resource rents as, you know, like leverage, as political leverage, right? So it's also, I think, a potential way in which, you know, like uh, uh, the rent question might or not, you know, like dialogue into, into the state capitalism debate, I think. Yeah, we don't, we don't have more questions. So I, I will use the power of my double position and I will ask you, Martin, a, a, a question or a, related to what we, related with what you were saying about the, the political left and Chile is experiencing um, a process of change, changing the constitution, a new government left, a center left wing oriented. Uh, so I wanted to ask you how, how what are your takeaways of this process? How, what, what are your expectations in terms of rent and the position of Chile in the global, in the global capitalism? Uh, what, what alternatives do you see um, what are the limits of this process that is starting is starting now in Chile? Well, Matias, that's a really interesting and timely question because actually, you know, like uh, some of the people that I've heard, you know, like speaking about we need to reclaim rent as an emancipatory tool for the left have been Chilean economists, right? So, you know, like there's been this kind of, you know, like a new generation of Chilean economists that have tried to break away with you know with the neoliberal uh, consensus, right? And and have and uh, have started to you know like dialogue with you know like some forms of you know like neo Keynesian economics, Marxian economics, dependency theory, neo structuralism, developmentalism. So people are thinking through these various you know like critical traditions. You know, Thorsten Bevelin, you know, like several of these classic you know like 20, 20th century authors with new debates on on eco socialism. Green New Deal and so on. And, and it's, it's been, you know, like a very stimulating intellectual environment. And, and I've heard, you know, like some economists making that claim, right? That, you know, like we need to reclaim rent as an emancipatory tool for the left. An interesting 
inside. And I think, you know, like uh, that might eventually lead to the kind of intra-left disputes that became really like difficult during, you know, in Ecuador too, right? You know, like uh, there's this important book by uh, Thierry of Franco's uh, Resource Radicals, which precisely points towards that kind of intra-left dispute of a resource nationalist left and an anti-extractivist left. And I think maybe, maybe uh, I don't know if I'm, 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 I'm correct or not, but so far in Chile, there is the, uh, that dispute does not exist uh, because for the, for the sole reason that the left uh, was not in power, right? Now that the left or the center left and move, you know, like a, a government with social democratic leanings and, and, you know, like a more radical position, uh, these kinds of intra-left disputes might eventually start to come into, into focus, right? And I think, you know, like a, seeing, you know, like the political culture, you know, like a, there is also this kind of, I wouldn't say open dispute or, or, you know, like struggle, but, you know, like there are some segments of the, of the, of the left that uh, deem, you know, like the anti-extractivist left in kind of a more, they call them hippies, right? To call them that they are these kinds of, you know, like that they're not connected with the material, you know, like uh, grounds of struggle and, you know, like, and, and, and there is this kind of, uh, and especially around the question of degrowth, uh, this kind of uh, internal dispute between the two lefts have, you know, like uh, uh, coming to the surface, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, the debate on, on, on the growth, you know, like in the Constitutional Assembly, uh, people have started to, you know, like some parts of a, a broad part of the left saying that, you know, like the growth is not uh, feasible in a country where you need to, you know, like uh, there are so many uh, unmet needs and, you know, like uh, many urgent, you know, like tasks of, you know, like poverty that need, that need to be taken care of. And so, you know, uh, uh, resource rents, you know, like need to be, uh, or, you know, like there needs to be, you know, like an expansion of mining and, you know, like uh, some, some other forms of primary commodity production, basically to foot the bill of, you know, like the, social, the government's social program. An expansive social program will need more extraction. So yes, I mean, that is, you know, like, a, uh, and I've heard, you know, like people, in, read, I, I recently read an interview of, of you know, like a, a member of the Constitutional Assembly, militant of the Socialist Party, saying that, right? So the proponents of degrowth want to transform Chile into a, into a wilderness area, you know, a national a reserve zone where, and that is not feasible for a country that needs to, you know, like to put food on the table for, you know, like 20 million people. So that was basically, I mean, I'm, I'm very, I'm putting it very bluntly, but, you know, like, I'm, it, I, I think it, it, it to some extent shows, you know, like uh, how this dispute might eventually uh, play out in the future. I don't know. Yeah, thank you. So there's no easy answer. Um, we have time for, for another question if someone is want to, to post it. While we wait for another question, I'll just add to that that I think that um, in terms of the kind of the political power of the state, particularly within the kind of new panorama in Chile, I mean, Martin knows much more about the context than I do of Chile, but part of the inspiration of our rent framework comes from Juan Inigo Carrera, um, who works out of Buenos Aires in Argentina with um, some colleagues of ours. And part of their research kind of locates the Latin American state as a key entity in the transfer and appropriation of rents, whether that's a neoliberal state or a neo-structuralist state, because of the nature of resource exports, there's a kind of <clears throat> centrality to the way in which, say, the exchange rate works by being overvalued as a way in which you cheapen imports, or way export taxes can be used to leverage and skim rents on agro or mining exports. The point is that Chile is a rentier state. And, but it's been a neoliberal rentier state and the primarily rents have been appropriated by capital. One of the political advantages of being a rentier or landlord state is that you can, through public policies, transfer and intervene into the rotation cycle of commodities to the world market in a way in which then captures rents and perhaps uses them 
and centralizes them in ways that perhaps in here community control or new forms of land ownership. So it's kind of like there's almost a political advantage to these forms of capital accumulation, which with political will and also conflict, right? This will lead to conflict in, in some sense or other. But there is an advantage in this frontier sense that politically you can cap capture um, and transfer rents uh, to society in general. And, you know, historically it's been through ways in which industry has captured rents, heart heavy large scale industry during the kind of ISI period. But that's not to say that you couldn't transfer rents to more kind of social um, e eco-socialist projects, for instance, you know, green transitions. So I think there's, yeah, there's much to be seen in terms of possibility there, I would say. I have a question. Um, yeah, go on. Maybe Thomas kind of answered a little bit just there, but I was, I was struggling to envision what like a, an emancipatory uh, rent would look like, and so trying to like be creative and think through that. And the first thing that that came to mind was just like carbon capture schemes, right? So like this idea that like uh, you know a, a state or an entity owns all of these natural resources and can kind of like create, um, you know, and will hold a monopoly over these particular assets or nature as an asset. And then, I don't know, I guess I was just wondering if you guys could be more specific about, or just say more about the emancipatory possibility, because like, you know, I'm the, where I think where I was going with it is maybe different than what you meant by that. I, we have a, a, one more question. Um, I will add it right now because we have five more minutes. So we have the two questions and uh, some final remarks for, from Martin and Thomas, and then we can wrap up. Please, it's not, it's not. Um, Yeah, thanks. I didn't want to ask a second question, but I saw that this room is uh, nice and, and, and kind of intimate. So I just helped myself. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Thomas's uh, comment about neocolonialism when he was responding to that question raised a question about the concept of rent. And this is kind of a really broad question, so feel free to just like, you know, answer parts of it. Um, but I was thinking about rent in relation to kind of debates around, um, or rather debates during decolonization in places like South, South Asia, for instance, where right? the category of development was you know, under considerable scrutiny. And it became a kind of category that exhibited some of the, some of the same tendencies as rent seems to be doing in, in what, you, what you've been saying, right? Like the kind of emancipatory possibilities of rent. Similarly, development, right? Had a, had a kind of similar charge where to deny that the colonial state undertook quote unquote development was in some ways to um, uh, delegitimate development by the post-colonial state, um, and conversely, if you if you if you look at something like the so-called modes of production debate, the entire debate was organized around denying that the colonial state undertook development, that it you know invested in in productive infrastructures, which was empirically just false, and that led to all kinds of confusions, and people were like, ah, no, that was still you know some kind of feudalism. But if you think about rent in relation to sort of late colonialism, the, the kind of period of the so-called developmentalist colonial state, I think it can open up interesting ways of rereading re some of those debates from the 70s and 80s, I think. Anyway, this is just like a total shot in the dark, but it just, what, what you guys just said opened up this kind of um, alternative way of thinking about rent in a context that is completely sort of different from Latin America in some ways. Wow, really, really interesting questions and also, you know, like points towards, you know, like the the interest in, you know, like uh, thinking rent in a different light, you know, like, uh, I mean, both Liz and Swarnap, you know, like appointed, I mean, it, it's interesting that, you know, like this, this caught your attention so much and something that, you know, like Thomas and I have been also thinking about, not systematically yet, but I think it would be good, I mean, we, if, if, if you want to, write more stuff on on, on 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 more research on rent i mean it's definitely important to look at to to tackle with this question right so 
Um, yeah, Thomas, I don't know if you want, if you'd like to. Yeah, no, I think that's a really fa fascinating, and really expansive question. It made me think immediately about the kind of the the way in which decolonization and you know formal political independence gave states, particularly in kind of where the Europeans were starting to leave Africa, control over natural resources, right? And what do states do when they have control over natural resources? They say, hey, we're going to form a monopoly and cartel, and we're going to dictate the terms of these prices because we're the landowners, right? So this was the this was the non-line movement and the demands for the new international economic order, which were fundamentally part and parcel of a progressive vision of control over natural resources in the then third world for socialist or non-aligned projects. And at the root, there was an emancipatory vision there. There was an anti-racist vision, a decolonial vision, which I think, you know, we often forget in current debates. So, I mean, that's I, that's one of the things that would come to mind in terms of the, the intricacies and the possibilities of, of solidarity, perhaps, you know, regional or across the global south in terms of the older ideas of, of development. Um, but then you have the added complexity, and this is kind of, you know, we've got two minutes left, so I won't go into this, but the materiality of resources changes, right? So OPEC has power because it's an oil producing cartel and it's a spigot. You can stop producing oil and you can kind of hike the price. It's very difficult to do that with agrarian commodities where the kind of rotation cycle and the, this, the kind of production um, time period is much longer. So agrarian producers don't have the same type of cartel power as OPEC. And that was one of the key weaknesses that were kind of revealed in the demands for the new international economic order when it was hoped that other countries in the global south could replicate what OPEC did by you know, creating cartels and monopolies over food and land. Um, but yeah, that was kind of a, a thought to finish on, I think. But I do think those, those, those kind of moments do bear significance to how we might think about rent at the moment. Yeah, definitely. And, and I also think that, you know, like sort of what you mentioned about, you know, like these, these you know, like uh, thinking development differently in a more, I mean, affirmative or, or, or positive light, you know, like it's, it's really interesting. Um, and, and it's something that also been, I've been thinking a lot in, in a side project I have on the popular unity project in, in Chile, you know, like the so-called Chilean road to socialism, where, you know, like some of the organic intellectuals and, and, and public officers, you know, like uh, in high positions, you know, like they wrote at that point, you know, during the 1960s, informed by dependency theory and, and, and this other liberation theology that, you know, like uh, there was, you know, like that it was an imminent critique of development, right? They said that, you know, like uh, capitalist development was fake development, was, you know, like basically, you know, like the, the facade for colonialism, right? So basically what Arturo Escobar argued in, you know, like his Encountering Development book, but they said, as opposed to Escobar, who just basically did a critique of, 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 of development, they offered an imminent critique. So they, they argue, okay, so we will reclaim development as ours, you know, like for a popular project, an emancipatory project, a radical project, and think development beyond capitalism. And, and I think that was really inspiring. I think that's, you know, like uh, thinking development beyond capitalism, it's something that, uh, that, that I think it's a, a really powerful way of looking at, 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 the, at the question. And, and it's something that was, you know, like very, and I think it connects to, to rent in, in, in several respects, you know, like I think, uh, well, pa pa Pablo Neruda has a, a poem titled Ode to Copper, where he says, you know, like copper will be ours, you know, like copper right now is an instrument of, you know, like capitalist destruction, right? It, it transforms mountains into, you know, like uh, uh, into garbage heaps, you know, like, uh, it, you know, like transforms uh, factory workers in Chicago into, you know, like monsters, you know, like, uh, and, and, and it, it is, you know, like a global apparatus for, you know, like exerting capitalist domination and destruction, but it will be ours and it will become, you know, like a, a light and, you know, like a, a, a soothing, you know, like a force in the global economy when it's harnessed by, you know, like the popular, I mean, in very poetic terms, but it was interesting, right? I mean, he, how he was rethinking, you know, like questions of, you know, like uh, resource governance in a very different way. Um, and I think that's something that, 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 that I, I find really, really exciting about this new tradition of, of, 
of, of radical republicanism that seeks to uh, precisely do an imminent critique of, of basically liberal democracy, right? I mean, to, to point the finger at liberal democracy and say, you are not capable of delivering real progress. You're not capable of delivering real freedom. You know, the freedom, your freedom is a past, you know, like a, a, a false freedom, you know, like it's not. And so, and so, yeah, I mean, one, one would, one might ask the same question regarding rent, you know, like it, can it be harnessed differently? I don't know. And, and, and in terms of climate change, you know, like this, the idea of, you know, like carbon capture, I don't know if, if you might, elaborate a bit further on that because I've, there are some some texts recently that have argued that you know like the atmosphere has become a key vector or site for for the for the circulation and extraction of rents you know like especially through these carbon offset mechanisms but I don't know if that if that's what you had in mind yeah I mean that was basically what I was thinking about and I think it does connect to um Swarnov's question because like yeah I was thinking about these kinds of a uh, like post-colonial emancipatory development schemes and how we still end up with indigenous dispossession and environmental catastrophe and all of that and making sure that that kind of stays part of the way that I'm thinking through some of these questions and so it's just kind of my way of of um reminding myself to um be attendant to that well we we are a little out of out of time so yeah uh but this has been a, a wonderful se uh, session um thank you martin and thomas for the presentation but also the discussion uh thank you david marvi uh, jenny kenny kelly for organizing the seminar and I hope we, we can stay in touch and, and thank you again for for uh, for attending this event. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys, bye. Thanks, thanks, yeah. everyone. bye. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really a thank great you. talk. Thank and you. Discussion. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Enjoy the.